Palm Creek Church, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three important relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at Plum Creek dot church or on social media to see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting any dollar amount to 720-606-5563. It's a secure connection with simple instructions to get set up. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you'll enjoy this message. Well, good morning, Plum Creek. Come on, let's stand up today. We're going to worship our Savior. We're going to sing it out. Come on. Who am I that the highest can be the world called? I was lost, but He brought me in His love for me.
it's so good to see you all here. Before you're seated, turn, greet somebody, tell somebody how lucky they are to be sitting next to you today, then grab a seat. Well, good morning and welcome to Plum Creek Church. My name is Tommy Cummins, and I'm on the student team here at Plum Creek. Special shout out to those of you who are worshiping with us online today. If this is your first time here with us, welcome. We are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us today because we know that there are a lot of great churches here in Castle Rock. Here at Plum Creek, you're gonna hear the phrase changed lives, changing lives, which simply means that what God has done in us is not only for us. If this is your first time, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. And one of the best ways that we can make that happen is if you'll fill out one of these next step cards that you'll find in the seat back pocket in front of you. You can fill that out during the service and drop it in the offering buckets, which will be at the door on the way out of service today. Really, we would just love to know that you were here to answer any questions that you may have and help you get plugged into this amazing community here at Plum Creek. Well, as I mentioned, the offering buckets will be at the door on the way out of service today. Giving of our tithes and offerings is something that we do every single week here at Plum Creek because we want God to be first in every area of our lives, and that includes our finances. Tonight, we're gonna have students right here in this room praising, worshiping God, having fun, and also hearing a kind of heavier message than typical. We're gonna be talking about depression tonight because we have so many students who are dealing with just that, even if they don't realize they're not the only one going through it. But we couldn't do that kind of ministry together collectively as a church body without all of us coming together and giving of our time and our resources. So thank you so much to those of you who do exactly that every single week. There's four easy ways to give here at Plum Creek. You can find out more information about all of them in the seat back pocket in front of you. Well, gentlemen in the room, you may or may not know this, but we have an awesome men's ministry here at Plum Creek called True Grit. And we have our second annual True Grit kickoff is happening this Friday, May 10th at 6.30 p.m. It only costs $5. We would love to have you here to learn more about that awesome ministry and how you can get involved. We need you to register online if you plan on coming by May 8th. You can go to plumcreek.church slash events to register. We would love to see you there. And then the following Wednesday is our next night of worship. We're gonna come together as a church body and sing and praise and worship our good God collectively together. That'll be Wednesday, May 15th at 6 p.m. But if you come a little bit early at 5 p.m., you can get a great meal for just $5. And every dollar that comes in for those meals is gonna go to help support our students that are going on mission trips this summer. So once again, we'd love to see you there for that. Well, at this time, we're gonna continue to sing and worship and praise our good God this morning. So if you are able, will you please stand and sing with us? Well, we're gonna sing a new song today. It's called Raise a Hallelujah. It's about battling the enemy through our praise. So come on, let's sing this out together.
church, I don't know what you're going through today, but I'm here to tell you that our King is alive. Do you believe it? Come on, there's power in our worship. Let's sing this out together. So sing a little louder. 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 Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Come on, sing it over your situation. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is the melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemy. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Come on. Louder, louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. I'm gonna stay in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Oh, I praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. 
every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Do you believe that today? Let's declare it in this place. There's an army.
God, you're worthy. You're worthy of all glory, of all honor, of all praise in this place today. And it's here we come just to declare your greatness and all that you are and all that you freely give. God, it's your breath. It's yours. It's your praise. It's your life that you gave to us, Lord. So God, you're the reason that we gather in this place today. You're the reason we come from all different places, from all different walks of life. You're the reason we sing these songs, these anthems, God, to bring glory to your name, to declare your greatness. God, remind us what it looks like to, to give our lives fully to you. Open our eyes to see you clear. God, we need more of you. More of you, less of us. So have your way in this place today. Restore, redeem, transform lives. We love you. We choose to give you all glory and all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Aren't you thankful for our great God today? Wow, you guys are singing good today. Thanks for singing it out. So awesome to hear you worshiping. And uh, thanks for coming today. At this time, please be seated. What's up, Plum Creek? How you doing? Everybody good? Can you help me say hi to those that are watching online? Hey guys, we're glad you're watching. And uh, man, I've heard some great stories over the last uh, couple of months of how the Lord has just used that live stream and an opportunity for people to, to dial in just based on some of the things that they're dealing with their lives. Maybe uh, for some of you, you've been able to use it when you travel too. It's awesome. So uh, can we thank all of our tech team for all the hard work that they do to make those things happen? <clears throat> it's awesome. I wanna uh, just go over a couple of quick things before I get started today. Uh, you know if you've been around Plum Creek for a while that there's two seasons where we really focus in together uh, to make a difference uh, around the world uh, through missions efforts and some things that we're doing through our partnerships here at church. And one is during Easter and then one is during Christmas. And this Easter, uh, one of the things that we felt really called to do, you know, we are partnering with an organization called Project Rescue and they're rescuing girls out of uh, sex slavery. And we helped to build a house last year because of your generosity or actually we helped purchase a house in Spain. And so there's a place for these girls in Alicante to be able to be rescued, to have a place to live. And kind of the next step of their uh, process of, of just kind of being able to overcome all that they've had to face is to be able to be educated and to get a degree. And so we have made a commitment to helping uh, the girls be able to get some education. And so we set a goal of $40,000. We're not quite there yet. And listen, if you, if you haven't given and you would uh, just spend some time praying about that, we're gonna be able to, for $40,000, take 25 gals all the way through college. That is a big deal. And you can think about uh, how that would be so life-changing for them. So if you haven't and you'd like to, I would encourage you uh, to jump on board to help us with this uh, opportunity to make a difference. And then uh, I also want you guys to know next week is Mother's Day. Some of you might not know that and make a note of it. And uh, make sure you remember that. But a couple of months ago, we asked my wife Beth if she would uh, consider speaking on Mother's Day. And she's never done a whole weekend before, so she's a little nervous about that, but she's going to do it. And so will you guys uh, keep praying for Beth? She was here in the last service. 
She's like, I'm running home to keep working on her message. And uh, I was like, oh, this is great. She knows what I have to go through every week now. This is awesome, right? But pray for her. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're, we're going over it together. And I'm really excited about uh, what the Lord has laid on her heart to share. So I just wanted you to know that she's going to be doing that. Uh, so if you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're in a series that we've called The Fourth Wall. And Gary kicked it off uh, last week, did a great job reminding us that God's everywhere. His presence is everywhere. And yet, even though his presence is everywhere, he wants to draw near to us. That's amazing. He's everywhere, but he wants to draw near to you. And the whole idea behind this fourth wall series, is, and many of you would be familiar with that term, maybe you have some background in theater or you watch movies and stuff and you get this understanding that, there, that there's this uh, like just the kind of unspoken wall between those that are acting and those that are watching. And every once in a while, there are certain shows or movies where you see a violation of the fourth wall, where someone uh, just addresses directly the crowd that's watching, uh, and it's kind of independent of all the rest that's going on behind them, but they just address, they look right in the camera, and they break that fourth wall. The reason why we felt like it would be important to talk about this is because we often live as though there's a fourth wall between us and God. And we know, we know in our minds that he's everywhere, but we don't really fully understand the ramifications of his presence being everywhere. And so over the last, uh, last week and this week, and for a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about this uh, together. And so I, I just want to share with you as we get started that I think ignoring the presence of God in your life is going to lead to a wrecked soul. And you don't want that. I don't want that. And so we need to live aware and we need to understand the implications of his presence in our lives. Temptation is being enticed to do something evil. Raise your hand if you've ever been tempted. Okay, everybody's hand should be up. You were tempted to not raise your hand thinking you're going to be cooler than all the rest of us, right? Everybody has been tempted. Uh, in Genesis, it says this, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. And why? Why? Because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. You must subdue it and be its master. It's important for all of us to be reminded of the reality that we're going to face temptation. You're likely going to face it today. And if it's not today, it will be tomorrow for sure this week. You are going to face temptation. We've talked about this before. The enemy knows where you are most tempted, and he knows when you're most likely to fall to temptation. He's coming after you. He's coming after me. He wants to wreck our lives. Now, you've turned to this uh, passage, 2 Samuel chapter 11. If that's on your app or on your Bible, I'm glad that you found yourself there. This is a very famous temptation story, and we've talked about it before, but I want to hone in uh, in a very specific way of something that I believe is important for us to see and how it relates to our fourth wall series. 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1, David is the second king of the nation of Israel, and it says this in 2 Samuel chapter 11, in the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege on the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace, and he looked out over the city, and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, we need to talk about that for just a second, because we're pretty much not familiar with roof baths, right? Thank God we're not familiar with roof baths, but that would have been very common in their culture. And I need to ask you a question. Has David done anything wrong? Not yet. <laughs> David hasn't done anything wrong yet. You're right. He hasn't done anything wrong. But now what I want you to see is the slippery slope of temptation. That reminded me for it. I, I, this is the stuff that goes through my head. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke at uh, Pastor Keith's church in Atlanta. You talk about immediate feedback. It's just like that the whole time. <laughs> it was glorious. I know you're paying attention when you're talking to me. I don't know what I just released there, but... <clears throat> Look at the slippery slope of temptation. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3. He sent someone out to find out who she was. And he was told she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. At this point, has David done anything wrong? Not yet. But did he do something stupid? He's starting to take steps towards something that he shouldn't do. This is not smart. And maybe not in the exact same way, but I would venture to guess for all of us, in some way, you and I are right smack dab in the middle 
of the world's most important yet incomplete process. The battle with sin and temptation rages in every single one of our lives. The war for what will effectively and functionally rule your heart. This is a battle that rages. Now I want you to see what happens. 2 Samuel chapter 11, now we look at verse 4. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after, uh, after having her menstrual period. She then returned home. Later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Now I need to tell you a couple details there. Like I'm not skipping over those details intentionally because you need to know her husband's off to war and it's David's baby. You see what I'm saying? Those details matter in this story. King David, God's choice to be the king of Israel, is now facing the very real consequences of his conscious decision to have sex with another man's wife. And this is what's so messed up. He has sex with another man's wife while that lady's husband is fighting in David's military. If you're a person of honor, which I would venture to guess that you are, you would see that this is absolutely deplorable. Now here's something else in this story that oftentimes gets missed. And if you're taking notes, I would challenge you to write down 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and go back and look at this uh, chapter later sometime this week. In, in this 2 Samuel chapter 23, it kind of details a little bit of the history of, of David's kingship, so to speak. And there's something really cool for those of us that enjoy these kind of details. There's this group of men called David's, David's uh, they're, they're David's valiant warriors, his most elite. They're called David's 30 mighty men. And I don't know if you knew this or not. It's important for you to know that Bathsheba's dad, Iliam, and her husband, Uriah the Hittite, are both part of David's most elite fighting force. And that hits me at a whole different level when I start to think about the fact David fought in battle with these men. These were his loyal guys. They were the ones that were willing to lay it all on the line to fight for him. And, and he comes up with this crazy idea and, and he, he does this thing that's absolutely deplorable and he, and he violates the trust that he has with these men that are in, that are in his army. And I want you to see now how David downshifts, downshifts into self-preservation mode. He comes up with this elaborate plan <clears throat> to cover up what he's done. So David sends message to the general of his army, so to speak. His name was Joab. And he says this. He said, will you send Uriah home to give me an update on how things are going on the battlefield? So, of course, the king speaks. So Uriah comes home and gives him the message of all the things that have been happening and then King David says to him, go home and relax. Do you see what he's doing here? He's trying to cover himself, isn't he? But Uriah, see, he's a man of honor. He has a whole different way of doing life. Uriah refused to go home. He slept at the entrance to the palace with David's palace guards. David's kind of blown away by this because it's spoiling his efforts to cover up what he's done. Look at verse 10. When David heard that Uriah had not got home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Look at what Uriah says. A man of valor and a man of character. Uriah replied, the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents. And Joab, remember that's his general, Joab and my master's men, speaking of David, are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Whoo, David, now he's in trouble. He's in trouble. So the next day he decides he's got he's to up the game a little bit. If he's going to cover up what he's done, He's going to have to take it to the next level. Look at verse uh, 12. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, someone say that, even then, even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife again. He slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Can I just tell you something that I saw this week I've never seen before? Uriah is more, at this time in David's life, Uriah is more of a man of character bombed 
then David was sober. Think about that for a second. David intentionally tries to get this man drunk to send him home to cover up his sin, and he still has more character than David in this moment than David did sober. So then King decides to send Uriah back to the battle with direct orders from the king, and I want you to see how twisted and how slippery this slope becomes. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14, so the next morning, David writes this letter to Joab, and he gave it to Uriah to deliver. Think about this. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah in the front lines where the battle is the fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to the spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting, and when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. You know what else I was thinking? That David trusted Uriah's character enough to not open that letter that he could send his death sentence with the very man back to war. So then Joab sends a messenger back to David to give him an update in verse 22. So the messenger, so the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete record, a report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said, and as we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, included, including Uriah the Hittite. Look at verse 25, what David says. This is, this is a new low. Well, tell Joab, that's his general, not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. In verse 26, Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, and she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives, and she gave birth to a son. Here's why this story is so important. Because when you read it, doesn't it kind of seem like David's living like there's a fourth wall? Like there's a wall that's set up, and he can do what he wants, he can behave the way he wants, he can make a decision to do something that like he's the king, right? So he can do whatever he wants, and now it even seems, because of the way this is all played out, that he's covered up this scandal. That's how it seems. And the challenge that I have for you today and for me today is that we need to live with a realization that there is no fourth wall. God's presence is everywhere. He knows what's going on in our lives. And you see, I purposefully left the last part of this verse that ends chapter 11 out because it helps us that even though it seems like he's getting away with it, he's not. Look at the last part of verse 27. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Hebrews chapter four, verse 13 says it this way. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes and he is the one to whom we are accountable. And someone in the room just went, Oh, crap. Because God knows what I did yesterday? Do this. Yeah, he does. And so now there's two responses. I was thinking about this this week. Now when we live knowing this, there's two ways that we could live. The first one is that we live scared because God is watching. The second one, and this is what I want to challenge each of us to do beginning today, is that we live aware knowing God is there, so we ask for his help. We live aware, knowing God is there, and we ask for his help. We must not live behind this imaginary fourth wall because God is with us. He is with us in our greatest moments of need. He's in our greatest moments of temptation, and he's not standing there waiting to whack you when you do something wrong. That's not the way it is. So here's my main thought. I would love for you to write it down. God's presence powers my fight. You see, all of a sudden, when we look differently at God's presence in the middle of life's most tempting situations, we can see this differently because God's presence is what powers our fight against temptation. What we need to realize is that God is our ally. He's always present. He's always ready. He's always able. And when you face temptation, when I face temptation, he's always present. He's always ready. And he's always able. When we live ignoring God's presence, we're denying the ultimate source of power and strength that we have available to us to be able to overcome our temptations. And I want to read with you this verse. Write this one down too. It's a great verse that obliterates the fourth wall concept in our minds. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Now here, now watch, the wall is being torn down now. And God is faithful. Someone say faithful. You need to remember that. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, look at me, it's not if you are tempted, it's when. It's going to happen. Remember we all had our hands raised just a minute ago, or almost all. When you are tempted, he, who, you, will you find the way out? No, look, his presence is our power. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. It was God's desire in this story to be able to empower David and give him the strength to overcome his temptation, just like he desires to give you and I the strength to overcome the temptations that we have to face as well. In your darkest days, in the moments of greatest temptation, Starting from today forward, I want you to remember. I want you to remember God's presence is there and God's presence powers my fight. You and I live in this weird middle ground of God's transforming <clears throat> process in our lives. And let's be honest. We're, this is what I think is so important for us. That's one of the reasons why I love this church and I want to lead this church this way and we just need to be real. Can we just be real? Sometimes aren't we all just a little bit of a hot mess? Every single one of us in this room, we can be a hot mess. I like that. You're pointing over the other direction to somebody. That is awesome. We all can be, and we need, to, we need to acknowledge that. We need to know that. We need to face that. We all still are facing temptation. Sometimes we fall to temptation. We still give way to wrong thoughts and wrong desires. Sometimes we say things that should never be said, and, and when we do things, sometimes it exposes the reality of our hearts, because you know what I think God cares about more than what you do? why why you do it what's the motivation of your heart why is it that you decided to do those things and so often the, the what what happens in our lives is exposing what's going on in our hearts and how do we stand a chance guys of overcoming this on our own i guarantee you you need to know this today with great certainty you can't you can't overcome um, all of this in your own strength but god's presence is going to power my fight Remember that verse, uh, Genesis uh, chapter four, verse seven. You will be accepted if you do what's right, but if you refuse to do what's right, then watch out because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. So can I just speak to someone that's here today and you say, boy, Doug, I walked into a doozy today. And you know what's going on in your life. You know what you've been dealing with. And you may have made some decisions that you wish you could go back and change. Or maybe you're here today and you're just starting to play with some stuff in your head. And maybe those thoughts have started to make their way to your heart and you're thinking about things. Or maybe you've already started doing some things that you know that you shouldn't be doing. God's already spoken to you about it. Maybe it has to do with uh, something in your, in your relationship with your spouse Maybe it has something to do with your sexuality. Maybe it has something to do with your finances. Maybe it has something to do with um, the way that you're doing business right now, thinking that if there was a way for you to be able to just be just a little bit untruthful, it's going to give you an edge and get you moving forward. Can I tell you something? Hear me today. Do what's right. Sin is crouching at the door, and it wants to master you. Instead, do what's right. Right. James wrote it this way in James chapter four, starting in verse five. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud. Don't try and do this on your own, guys. But gives grace to the humble. So Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close. Gary talked about this verse last week. Come close to God and he will come close to you. He's everywhere, but he wants to draw near. 
Here's what's interesting. Um, I read this this week in one of the commentaries that I read on this passage of Scripture. There are some theologians that believe, and I'm not sure how they totally would know this, but there are some theologians that believe that from this moment when David uh, sinned and did all that he did to cover himself in this uh, situation that he was in, that, there, that it was a year before there's a recorded prayer from David again. That's a long time. The very thing that would power his fight, he was pushing away. Listen, isn't that true for most of us? We make decisions to do things that we shouldn't. Doesn't it sometimes feel like we don't feel worthy of being in his presence? So we push away from the very thing that gives us the power to overcome. That's not gonna work because God's presence is what powers our fight. And practicing the presence and the power of God is our greatest ally and our greatest strength. So remember our fourth wall verse. And God is faithful. He is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. See, every one of our temptations, every time we face a temptation, we find ourselves at a crossroads of decision. Am I going to give in or am I going to ask for help? Am I going to give in or will I ask for help? You will never have a temptation that comes without a choice. Every time it comes with a choice, You always have an option, so stop and slow down. Count the cost and ask for his help. Because being tempted isn't a sin. It's what we do with those temptations. The enemy wants you to feel guilty about being tempted so that you start to turn away from the very source of the power that can help you overcome. Those feelings rather should be an alarm that triggers or initiates our plan of attack when temptations come. Recognizing and realizing our need You see, David could have turned away. See if you can't find yourself in this uh, line of of just kind of uh, reiterating the story. He could have turned away. His look became a gaze, didn't it? And his gaze became a stare. And that stare initiated some thoughts. And those thoughts eventually went to his heart. And that's when he began to take action. The same as it is with all of us. That same slide, that same process. And that's why we need to practice the presence of God daily. This relationship with God and God's presence, his presence that's always there is what helps us to be held accountable. So like this week, I want you to, when you face temptation, be like, he's watching, right? Because there's accountability in that. When you know, like David knows, you can't get away with it. He's watching. Do you know sometimes I think the greatest and the scariest place to be is when you think you got away with it? So that can haunt you more, can't it? Sometimes you wish you'd just get caught so that we can get on with it and move forward. But his presence and and a relationship with him will give you a desire to please him, will help you to want to live to honor him. When you live close and you're in relationship with him, his relationship will help you to remember where your strength to overcome temptations really comes from. So I want to give you a couple of very practical ideas that starting today you could implement in your life that will help you, help you to be able to overcome the temptations that inevitably you'll be faced with later today, tomorrow, and this next week. The first thing, and this is kind of piggybacking on something that Gary said last week, I want you to start your day with a declaration. <clears throat> start your day with a declaration. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse five. So we'll do verse five and, and a little bit of verse six. And I want you to use the words of these verses to be what you declare First thing tomorrow morning, God's promise to us through the Hebrew writer is this, is that he, I as God in this situation, God will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So look at verse six. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. So how does that work? Tomorrow morning when you wake up, I would love for you to just just stomp your foot and say, hey, Hebrews 13, five and six, that's where I'm starting my day. I know that God is faithful. He will never fail me. And I know that I can trust him because he will never abandon me. So now I have confidence as I approach this day. Knowing that there will be things that I'm going to face, I will have confidence because the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Poof. If you start your day every day with that declarative statement, it's going to change the way you think. God, you are with me, like Gary said last week. I'm going to need your help because the more you give in to temptation, the more you lose control. But let's call it what it is. 
and let's tackle it head on. How did God's chosen man end up in this place? The king, God's cho- the man after God's own heart. How did, he, how did he end up here? One bad decision at a time, just like you and me. The next thing, I want you to write this down. Think about wherever it is that you're currently being tempted. What is it that tempts you the most right now? I think you need to call that out. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to nip sin in the bud. Just nip it in the bud. I want you to pay attention because the longer sin sits, the harder it gets to resist it. The more ground we give the enemy, the more ground he wants. Perhaps you've heard this quote before because it's very famously been shared by guys that do what I do. Martin Luther wrote this about temptation. He said this, you cannot keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. What a great thought. Like, there are thoughts that are going to fly through our mind. Have you ever had one of those? You're like, Grah! where did that come from? Why did I have that thought? Now, that's not a bad thing. You did nothing wrong. But what you do with it is so critically important. God, I need your help. I need your help to overcome this temptation. I ain't letting no bird make a nest in my hair. That would be unwise. So we can't let those thoughts continue to fester because if we give the enemy ground, he's going to want more. He's going to take more. You give in, you let sin fester, you let it stay, and it only gets worse. So in order to nip sin in the bud, third thing I want you to write down is that you need to take time today and this week to examine yourself regularly. Again, remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's our response to the temptation that can lead to life or death. James chapter 1, verse 14 says it this way, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful action and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. The more you give into temptation, you see the more you lose control of it. And then the final thing that I want you to write down, and this is for all of us, and, and this is for some of you that grew up in church, perhaps, and you knew that, like, or, or you felt and were kind of taught that it's about your behavior, and God's just ready with his baseball bat to get you, so make sure you be, and he's everywhere, you know? This is how people used to talk about these things a lot. Here's what I want you to remember. Write this down. God is for me, not against me. God is for me, not against me. If you're here today and you know that you've made mistakes, you need to be reminded we all have. We all have. And no matter how much ground you have given up to the enemy, God is still there. God loves you. He loves you and he knows you and he wants to empower you to overcome. When you've done what you shouldn't have done, God is there. And he loves you. He cares about you. He wants to give you the plan, the way out. When you've gotten caught and the consequences are real, God is there. He knows you and he loves you. We must never forget there is. Don't live like there's a fourth wall. God is right there and he wants to draw near to you and I. We read this verse, 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven. 27, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And if you're not familiar with the story, you miss so many beautiful things about the heart of our God that really is ultimately about restoration and healing and redemption and the fresh start and moving in the right direction. You might remember some of you that David, when he was young, was a shepherd. He took care of his, his dad's sheep. And when you turn the page from chapter 11 to chapter 12, you see that the Lord sends a prophet. His name is, his name is Nathan to come and talk to David about what he has done because God knows, God knows. And Nathan comes and he, and he sits with David and he says, I want to tell you a story. David said, okay. He said, there were these two guys. One of them was super wealthy and he had lots of livestock, lots of sheep. And then there was a poor, a poor family too. And this guy, he had one lamb, he had one. And he said, so this wealthy guy, he has a party at his house And instead of using one of his own lambs for the meal, he goes and he takes the one lamb that the poor guy has. And David is furious. He's so angry with this story. He says that man deserves to die. You see, there is no fourth wall. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, then Nathan says to David, you are that man. 
The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. Could you imagine what that moment must have felt like for David? The consequences of David's sin are real. <clears throat> when you read the story, you'll see he had to pay a price for this. Just like the consequences for our sins are real too. But a few verses later, there's this beautiful statement by the prophet that says this to David, the Lord has forgiven you. And we need to hear that today. We need to know that God is a forgiving God. Even when it feels like it's too late, even when sin feels like it's crushed our lives and our relationships, even when we've taken the bait and given in, God is still right there in the middle of it and he wants to redeem those situations. The enemy wants to feel, make you feel like trash for what you've done, but God not only sees what you should have done, he sees what you need to do to move on from here. And he has the grace and the mercy to extend his love and his power towards you and I to help us to be able to get there. And if you've never known of the correlation between these different passages of scripture, if you would also please write down Psalm chapter 51, and I would love for you to go back this week and read Psalm 51 in light of what we've talked about today. Psalm 51 is, is David praying from the very depths of his broken heart about what he had done with Bathsheba and Uriah. And he cries out to God, and there's two verses that I want to share with you from that psalm today. Psalm 51, verses 10 and 11. And David's praying from a place of brokenness, and he says this to God, just like you and I need to, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Here's the way I want you to think about our relationship with the Lord uh, something's happened as, as technology has developed that's changed all of our lives. And I guarantee, like me, you've said this, how did we ever, how did we ever do life without this? GPS. Like, that thing gets me where I need to go every time. You agree? You ever, ever had that thought? Like, how did, you know how we used to do it? We would call people and say, hey, how do you get there? They're like, okay, you get on the road and you drive to this road and you turn left. And you're like, wait, left, right? Yeah, left. And you write it down in sequence and your wife would tell you where you're supposed to go. Now she's off the hook. Like you just got to pay attention and listen to the phone and it'll tell you where to go. And you know what happens when you don't listen to the phone, right? You make a wrong turn, you do something wrong and it says recalculating, right? Like I told you where to go, what's wrong? Don't you wish it would say that? That's what your wife wishes it would say. Like, hey, I told you where to go. That's what she used to say. <clears throat> Why don't we listen to it when it tells us where to go? Because if we don't do what she says, we're going to end up in the wrong place. Hey, whoa, hang on a second. Seems a whole lot like the voice of God, his Holy Spirit and his presence in our lives. If we don't do what it says, we're going to end up somewhere we don't want to be. But what I want you to hear today is there's always this voice of God that says, recalculating. We could still head the right direction. Recalculating. Did you learn to listen to the voice? Recalculating, let's head in the right direction. Because our God is a redemptive God. So one of the two responses that we hear when we talk about this, God's presence, aware of what we're doing, is we can live scared. We can live scared that God is watching and he's gonna get me like the lightning's gonna strike. Or rather, we can live aware, knowing that God is there, and learn to ask for his help because it's his presence that powers my fight. Will you bow your heads for just a moment? <clears throat> Inevitably, there will be a time this week where I'm gonna be praying that the Lord reminds you of what we've talked about today, and you're gonna be tempted, and it's a crossroads of decision. Will you give in to this, or will you ask for help? in my prayer is that you'll remember what we've talked about and you will know that God's promise to us is that he will never fail us, that he will never abandon us. So we can have a new level of confidence, Hebrews 13 says, that God is my helper. So we don't approach the week that lies ahead with fear, rather we have confidence because we know our God is near. 
Lord, will you please help us this week, every single one of us in this room, to be reminded of this in a very real way. And Lord, for the one that is here today who has made some mistakes, as we all have, will you help us to come back to you with the same heart of brokenness that David did? And with a sincere heart, pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Father, we pray against the enemy's temptations that are coming at us this week. Help us to stand strong. Help us to live for you and help us to overcome temptation with your help. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Can you help me thank Pastor Doug for this great reminder that God's presence powers our fights. Well, just a couple quick things before you go. If you have a child or a teenager who has access to a smartphone or the internet, we have a workshop next Saturday morning, the 11th at 10 a.m. It's absolutely free, but we would love to give you some tools, some resources, some ideas, some knowledge that will help you navigate that conversation because we wouldn't give our 16-year-old keys without first teaching them how to drive, right? And yet we do that so often when it comes to technology. So we would love to help in that process. You can register online line at plumcreek.church. We would love to see you there. Once again, that's completely free. Again, gentlemen in the room on your way out, we would love for you to stop out at the, uh, our True Grit guys are out there right now. They would love to give you some more information about the upcoming event. And as always, our ushers will be at the door to receive our tithes and our offerings for this morning. And we will have people down front that would love nothing more than to pray with you today. We love you so much. We hope you have a great week. Go in grace and go in peace today.